and welcome to Data Diversity Talks, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers around data. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking with William A. Tannenbaum, lawyer, partner, and the head of AI and data law practice at Moses Singer. More and more companies are considering investing in data literacy education, but still have questions about its value, purpose, and how to get the ball rolling. Introducing the newest monthly webinar series from Dataversity, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy, where we discuss the landscape of data literacy and answer your burning questions. Learn more about this new series and register for free at dataversity.net. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity. And this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management to understand how they got there and to be talking with people who can help make these careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. And today we are joined by William A. Tannenbaum, lawyer, partner, and the head of AI and data law practice at Moses Singer. And normally this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Bill, hello and welcome. I'm really glad to be here and to uh, speak with all the Dataversity members. So this is very exciting. You're the first lawyer that we've interviewed. We've interviewed a lot of different practitioners and consultants and uh, vendors and marketing, but first lawyer. So, uh, and as I mentioned, you are a partner and head of AI and data law practice. So what does that mean? What do you do? Well, a lot of firms, when they focus on data, they focus on privacy and the risks of you know, data breaches and the stuff like that. Uh, The group I've built takes a very different approach. We focus on data as a business asset, something Mm -hmm. that can be used externally to commercialize data and something that can be used internally to develop strategy and to, uh, you know, improve operations and actually reduce legal risk as well, right? Because there's regulations you need to comply with. And we also focus on how do you make Data professionals, how do they work with IT professionals? So when you use data as a change agent, you know, the data drives the ship, that's the strategy, but it needs to be implemented with the IT team. So we work with ITOs, chief CIOs, uh, chief data officers, and in-house legal departments. Fascinating. So uh, so how do you how do you work with data specifically in your job? So is it mostly advising or do you have a lot of data as well that you rely on to assist companies like this? Well, we use a lot of internal data here at the firm and we use some AI to do our stuff. But to focus on what the group does, that serves clients, right? We provide services to companies that come to us with either you know, strategic questions or specific questions. So a lot of the things we do are, I guess there's four of them. One is we help companies develop internal data policies. Mm-hmm. And that would be, you know, how do you govern um, compliance? How do you govern compliance with regulations, with company policies? Um, lawyers call something playbooks, which are really a whole bunch of templates for starting contracts that you um, use to reflect company goals, limits, liability, and then they get negotiated. But we draft the play the playbooks for companies. Then the other kind of agreements we do, um, and, and let me just back up a second. So a, a policy isn't really an agreement, but it's very similar to an agreement. It's just not a legal document that forms a contract. Okay. And then the other types we do are if there are intra-company divisions that are exchanging data and the data professionals want to be sure the data is not misused because it was built in a certain way, then that's an intra-company contract. Then there's two kinds of external contracts. One is when you do a contract with a provider, a vendor of data services or data products. And then the other one is when you're doing an external contract with another company. So you're commercializing your data you're providing data, you're on one side or the other. 
Um, so those are the basic kinds of agreements we do. And in connection with the agreements, there's you know, what we call counseling and advice. So we will advise on the risks because I could write an absolutely perfect contract, except the other side wouldn't sign it. You know, so we have to decide what the business goals are and prioritize the big ones. And there's always some risk. So we have to take the risk and then put it in a box so that it's manageable. Um, and then we talk about intellectual property protection, privacy laws, data breach, you know, all this legal stuff that people come to us to say, how do we do this? And, uh, and that's what we do. I love and then it. Again, again, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but we also work again, as I said, with the combination of data and IT, and then work very closely with in-house legal departments or procurement, whoever in the company is in charge of, of doing data type things. That's, that's great. Very um, important and uh, things that companies need to tackle and address. And, and I love that proactive approach. Um, but let's back up here a little bit. So tell me, Bill, when when you were very young, just a wee lad, uh, did you, is this what you wanted to be when you grew up? But did you always want to be a lawyer, first of all? Um, not when I was a wee lad, but when I got older, yeah. And yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, the, the history is kind of interesting. So, uh, I went to college, I went to Brown and Brown, you can make your own major. So I designed one in the history of science and technology. And wow. then I decided that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And when I was a young lawyer, um, there really wasn't like it law. It was a little too new. And mm -hmm. I did become the president of an organization called the um, International Technology Law Association. And that was a bunch of lawyers who were in this field. We were new in the field and we were going to kind of make it up because it didn't really exist. And just a secret. So close your eyes, close your ears. But a lot of things that lawyers do is make stuff up. So the new stuff happens at our desks first. It's not like you can read a case about this. It's not like you can go read a book. So we think really hard and decide... How do we structure this? Um, so I did a lot of technology based on my major. And then I started doing intellectual property. And then I started doing technology services for companies. And in recent years, I've decided that data is an asset and that most law firms are not approaching it in the right way. So that's when we go back to when I discussed it as a business asset. And so right now, um, from a legal point of view, you know, there are legal boxes that people like to put things in. It's IP, it's real estate, whatever it is. I think the data as a commercial entity, as an asset, doesn't really fit within a legal box. So, you know, what do you do about that? Um, and there are two ways to approach it. You can have a general theory of what data is for legal purposes. And it doesn't mean it's the same thing as for real life purposes. But Trust us, lawyers know what we're doing and we need to put it in a box so that if it ever goes to a judge, they know what to do with it. But there's a lot of innovation going out there and that's the really fun part. So just to go back for a second. So when we do data licensing, what's the problem? Problem is how do you define the scope of a data license? How do you define what people can do with the data? So as I mentioned at the last speech I gave at Dataversity, um, I've developed a model that I call decision rights. And that's how, how do you define the scope? You say it the easiest way, the most precise way to say is, I'm giving you this data and you can make certain decisions on this data. And these are decisions you can make. So just for example, it'll be healthcare. So you can make a series of decisions relevant to healthcare, but you can't use that data and go out and do something with automobiles and then sell it. So that's a way to define the scope of data when there's no real good intellectual property license or something that fits. And that's kind of an example of what we do. And we often get asked, well, why don't you just have the AI write the contracts? Um, good question. Um, do I think AI is smarter than I am? No, I don't. I think I can do this better than AI can. And the limitations of AI are 
that there's a lot of soft parts of contracts. You know, you put material compliance in, or you say three out of seven times. You know, there has to be some squishy stuff to get the deal done. And sometimes no one really knows what their exact requirements are. So that gets worked out. So AI can't really deal with the squishy stuff. And also sometimes the contracts are just a little bit illogical because there are provisions that don't exactly line up or you have to make compromises to get the deal signed. So that's a judgment call. You know, Two days before you're signing the contract, you got 10 issues. What are you gonna do? You know, Usually lawyers will look at it and say, well, we'll give you two, we get two, and then we'll compromise on the others. That's not something a machine can do right now. But stay tuned, machines are pretty smart, lawyers aren't mm -hmm. perfect, and this will go. There, I, AI is getting better, for sure. There is no doubt about that. Uh, it's pretty Definitely. impressive what's happening. But so you created your degree at Brown. What inspired you to do that? It sounds like you have a lot of passion around technology. So where did that come from and, and what drove that decision? Well, that's one of the reasons I went there. It's because yeah. you can make up your own major. And yeah. Brown is really good for people who have kind of an entrepreneurial approach to their education. You know, people who are very curious, people who don't want to do the normal things. And um, so we have a saying that, that there's this college up in Cambridge, which will remain unknown, unnamed. And they think that they rule the world. And so we say, fine, you rule the world. Us guys at Brown and Providence, we change it. And uh, mm. that's what we do. So I, like I was it. very attracted to that whole thing of Brown. Yeah. And then I like technology. Mm -hmm. And I will say this, I am not a STEM person. You know, I don't want to sit there and do higher math. Mm -hmm. Not sure I could. But um, the whole premise of my major was that technology and science, they don't float above the world. They're part of their time. So there was social Darwinism before there was Darwin, you know, and then Darwin, you know, part of the whole culture of time at the frame, uh, frame at the time was that, you know, there were certain countries to be blunt and they could have colonies and they were better. So there was a hierarchy. So you see a lot of that in Darwin. You know, if you do it today, you're going to do more genetics and you don't have these the cultural baggage. So the fun part about history of technology is that it's a branch of intellectual history, mm -hmm. but it's still history. And uh, what is history? History basically is saying what happened and why and why do I think that's the case? Because things change over time. They're very present tied. So people are going to think of the Civil War one way today than they did 100 years ago. Um, so that's kind of the fun part. And then when you get to law, it's very simple. And it's simple. It's like, what do you want to have happen and why? So it's the same kind of thinking. And that's why I enjoy both. So then as you're majoring in the history of technology, what what inspired the addition of um, going to law school and law school and becoming a lawyer? Because um, I just like I like lawyering, or I thought I would. And my yeah. father was a lawyer, so I got an huh. insight. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm a little nerdy, so I did my research and um, decided what I like. And I knew when I talked to people that there was room for innovation. You know, a lot of people think lawyers just do things with paper that have already been done before. And some do, I don't. So when I was doing the history of, when I was doing software law really early, there weren't a lot of rules that we knew. So it was fun just to kind of create it. And it's kind of the same thing with data. When I went back before, it's like, what is data legally? Mm -hmm. So in a contract, you may define it one way. And in another contract, you may define it another way because that's tied to what you're trying to accomplish. So the connection between college and being a lawyer is that it's, there's a lot of commonalities to it, but law kind of takes it you know, to the nth degree. And I will say that my daughter has an MFA in creative nonfiction. I don't really know what that is, 
But I think I do creative nonfiction when I'm a lawyer. A lot of respect for that. Yeah, I that's amazing. I, I love that. I love that you're innovating and and not just uh, uh, practicing the laws that are in place already. And that if I did the same thing for five years, I just wouldn't do it. And the the fun part about being a tech lawyer is whatever you're doing in five years, you're not going to be doing it. You don't know exactly what you're going to do, but then something comes along, like outsourcing. I did outsourcing. When I started as a lawyer, was there outsourcing? No. And when you're doing data, could there have been what there is today? No, because now you've got more powerful machines. They're a lot more easier to program. They're faster and storage is virtually cheap. So you couldn't have done all these analytics five years ago. You know, there just wasn't underlying tools to make it happen. So that means, could you do data five years ago? No, because no one was doing it. So now people have started and things are usually ahead of the law. So we're trying to catch up and make it safe. You talked already about a couple of different definitions of data. So what is there a foundation, uh, foundational definition that you kind of stack everything else on or kind of shift this way or that? What is what is your definition of of data? Well, um, it's a little squishy, but that's intentional because mm -hmm. if you make it too rigid, then you can't do what you need to do. So what lawyers do is we manipulate concepts. So we don't want them to be solid concepts because then there's no room for innovation. And it's like big data works with stuff that's happened. You know, lawyers deal with stuff that hasn't happened yet. So we have to be innovative about what are we gonna do with this new problem? You know, or how are we gonna solve this weird problem but still make it fit in the law? So we have to take something and put it in a legal box to make it work, but it's not exactly, you know, if, if it's in the legal box and that's a little bit of form over substance is what we call it, but we have to bridge that gap. And um, so, again, the fun part is just the innovation and my definition of data. Um, you can debate whether data is a technology or not. I don't really think it's a technology, even though, you know, if you think it operates and accomplishes things, then you may claim that's a technology. But the focus that I use is what I built my law firm's group on, that it's an asset. And uh, sometimes it's a tool, sometimes it is what you're buying. You're buying a bunch of data. And I think, you know, in my mind, you have data that turns into information that generates insights. And when the rubber hits the road, it's when it generates an action, an event, a result. So I think there are those four stages in data and you know, when data turns into information, it's not quite data anymore. You know? And then when it turns into an insight, it's clearly not data, but if you're using data and you're not using it to get an insight and to do something, then what are you doing? So you know, that's what the business use is and that's what we do. I love that. I, you know, I've heard over the years, of course, in our webinars and things like that, you know, many people call data as an asset, but um, I really like that perspective of it. I think that's really uh, makes it a lot more clear for me anyway, thinking about it in terms of, in legal terms. Yeah. And sometimes the old definition of asset wasn't really an asset. Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, outside of data, what would an asset be? An asset would be this really cool machine that makes a car. You know, that would be your asset. Um, so sometimes when people talk about asset, they talk about it in the, di the data science purpose, which is it's an artifact, it's a thing. We consider it something that has business value. I mean, that's when you call a lawyer, and that's what I mean. So you could, asset means one thing in data professional land, and it means something else in the commercial and legal land, which, of course, is a problem because then people, you know, they're both saying data asset, but they mean different things. Me too. Very, very true. <laughs> With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. So 
Do you see the importance of data management um, and, and working with so many companies now dealing with uh, their data? And um, do you see the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? Well, data doesn't manage itself, period. It's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. So someone has got to do it. Someone's got to build a solid foundation that can be flexible enough to do different things. But without the foundation, what are you doing? You know, you you don't have a common vocabulary. You don't have a common data set. You just, uh, you know, you're just spinning your wheels. You know, it's like asking some IT guy to define data. For an IT guy, data flows through pipes and it doesn't really have a content. Um, so I think data management is really critical and it's become more and more critical when data is a change agent, data has external commercial value. So to make it an asset, you have to manage it. And, you know, it's easier to build in regulatory compliance and to retrofit it. So, you know, management is going to be that. And when data becomes internally strategic for a company, then things change because now it's, you know, business people are really starting paying attention to it, you know, and do they want self-service analytics? Do they want cloud-based analytics? You know, what kind of machine learning do they want? So when you talk about all that stuff, that's terrific, but you're not going to have AI without data, you know, and you're not going to have good AI without good data. And, sure. and I'll give you one example, because I do some healthcare tech. And they were trying to teach the machine to distinguish between like a skin rash and a malignancy. Mm -hmm. And feed it a lot of photographs and you let it basically do pattern recognition. Well, what was the flaw in this approach to data? When doctors think that it's a malignancy, they usually measure it because without the machine, that's an indicia of you know, the risk. So for some reason, when these people did these photographs, they put a ruler in when they thought it was malignant. So when you feed it to the machine, what does the machine do? The machine it's says, ruler. Ruler or no. <laughs> so at the end of the day, you basically ended up where you started. Yeah. When people thought it was malignant, they put a ruler in. So the machine mm -hmm. goes, oh, if it's a ruler, it's malignant. So you know, unless you're really focused on what data is, then you can't manage it. And there are certain assumptions that like people who are not in the data world, they make bad assumptions. So going back to healthcare again. So there's this thing called an EHR. You have to have mm -hmm. acronyms. No fun being a lawyer if you don't have acronyms. So um, EHR is the electronic health records, which is the key database, you know, that hospitals use. So somebody from Silicon Valley will come in and go, wow, look at the size of this database and look at the longitudinal dimensions and look at the breadth. It's got 10 billion patients in it. This must be really valuable. And uh, what do AHR systems have? They have, you, you put the illness in a box and the box turns out to be reimbursable or not reimbursable. So if you think about it hard, What's the purpose of EHR? The purpose of EHR is to get paid and get reimbursement. Okay? It's not a collection of clinical data. So if you run all these analytics, you're running analytics on kind of what the government decides is a reimbursement box, which isn't the same thing as what doctors would do. So you run all this data analytics on a very big data set that is built to do something that you're not doing. It's built to get reimbursed and you're trying to figure out how to do medicine. So good data management is, okay, if you want to do this, here's the data you need. And you don't need this, even though it's really cool and attractive and it's got a lot of data in it because it's built for a different purpose. And I think that's where when we work, that's where we work with people who do data management because they can tell the external people, what do you really need? And then we'll give you the data. Or we have data and you can do certain things with it. And we have a high confidence in it. But if you want to do it for something and you're using third-party data that, you know, we bought for one purpose and you want to use it for another purpose, it's like, whoa, it's back to my EHR example. It's not fit for purpose. So I see data management as if you're going to use it as an asset, then you've got to manage it. And if you manage it, you've really got to know the science of data. 
Um, and that's what makes you special. In my I like mind. it. Yeah. So what would advice would you give to people who are either looking to get into those data jobs or into a career like yours where they want to be a lawyer and work with uh, data as an asset? Let's put, I'm going to ask myself a different question. Okay. okay. So here's the question I ask. So you're in data management in a company and the world is changing. What are your opportunities? So let me ask that question. If that's okay with you, I like that question. Yeah, so it's a great question. I think the answer is you've got to think about it from the perspective of the business units, which everybody does, but you really have to keep that in mind. And then you've got to understand that when you do a deal and it's really critical to the company, the people who are doing the deal, who are usually lawyers and business people, are under intense CEO or C-suite scrutiny because it's now critical and it hasn't been done. So that means a couple of things. That means you have to learn to speak English because these people don't speak data. So if you speak mm -hmm. data to them, you say data asset or, or uh, you know, integrity of data or life cycle of data or stuff like that, they're going to assume it means something that it doesn't mean. So sure. you have to set the stage for them. And then if you want to succeed, you got to pretend you're sitting at that executive table and you got to say, okay, those people don't want to know about all the good stuff that I do. They don't want to know my homework. You know, they just want to assume what they want to assume. So you've got to think, what are they trying to accomplish? And the more that you can help them accomplish that, then that you become a key valuable guy. It's like, we don't understand what this data is, but, but Sally can tell us that um, you can do certain things with this data, stuff you haven't even thought about yet. And certain things are a little risky. And then you become part of the business team. And, you know, I think that's fun, right? Because you're now you're doing something, you know, to, uh, I don't want, it's just not making money. It's just kind of doing something cool, right? Because now data does things that it didn't used to do. So my advice would be, you know, you can either do data stuff, which is a very satisfying thing, or you can kind of move over and be a real advisor to those executives that are doing something commercial. You know, and then everybody always dream, not everybody, but a lot of people, I would love to be in the C-suite. I would, you know, like to be at that. All right, if you're there, then the pressure's on, you know, because you have to do something different than you used to do. So if you're there, you can't be quiet. And if you're there, you can't say this is the perfect result because from a lawyer's point of view, you know, to do a deal, there's always risk. So you have to assume risk. And so you have to have somebody tell you how risky is the risk. You know, and that's one of the things data people can do because the other people really don't have any idea. You know, so it's your, you know, it's your fundamental knowledge of what you're doing. And then if you need more data, you're going to say, we don't have this data, right? You want to do all this marketing stuff and we have no data on any marketing campaigns, you know? And then for some reason, marketing and sales are different. Not that I understand that, but whatever the difference is, it's different. So then you got to, you've got to deal with that. So my advice is just, you know, think about it from the other perspective. And I say this because that's how I do contracts. I sit there and go, okay, what does the other side want? What does the other side think the risks are? And then I have a better understanding of what I need to do. And unless you understand what the other person is thinking of, you can't keep moving forward. And I just did a contract where what the other person was thinking of was just stupid. And so we had to kind of politely reorient them to a better paradigm to deal with the problem. And I'm not saying that's going to happen at your company, but I am saying there's going to be a certain lack of fine-tuned understanding. And that's what you bring to the table. You know? Makes sense. And any advice of uh, if somebody wants to be... Uh... A lawyer in in this space? So if you're going to be a lawyer, you've got to decide, I think, that you're comfortable with uncertainty and you're very excited about being creative. And I know most people don't think we're creative. A lot of people think we're just this tax you pay to walk across a bridge and lawyers are fungible and, you know, all right, we're going to pay a tax. That's just what we have to do, you know, or we've got to do legal compliance to stay in business. Um, 
Uh, if that's all you want to do, be a legal compliance officer. You know, if <laughs> if you want to take something that's new and make it work, then if you're a lawyer, you've got to be the kind of guy who's comfortable with making stuff up and and innovating. Um, and then things different come along. Okay, so now we got AI tools. Well, AI tools help lawyers, right? And so it's going to be all right. That's cool. Let's use this tool. If you're a software programmer, probably good for being a lawyer. If you're a math person, really good for being a lawyer because you understand logic. You know? Now, logic's going to fall away in the ninth inning, but at least it helps you bring you know, a good kind of clarity of thought. So I think it's, uh, you know, if you go to law school, it changes how you think. It really does. It's a whole new, and that's basically what law sure. school does is, I mean, they teach you law, but they teach you how to think differently. And that's when you talk to a lawyer, you know, what do we do? We go, okay, what do we want to do? What could go wrong? What are we going to do when it goes wrong? Yeah. Okay. Then it's going to go wrong again. So what do we do when it goes wrong again? Then it's going to get weird. So how do we want to put it back in the box? That's stage three. And so, you know, when I approach a thing, I think about this five steps ahead. And then I talk about it with my client. And then I don't go start with the fifth step. I start with the first step when I'm doing this. But I have an idea of where I want to end up. So I think if you're a lawyer, you've got to have an internal path. And it's got to be grounded in, you know, science and tech. And you've got to open your mind because five years ago, you couldn't do something. And now you have a tool where you can do it. So if you're not willing to stick up with the tech and the different practices and really understand data management, data quality, and data governance, you know, this is just some weirdo black box to you, and you're not going to be any good to anybody. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. That's great advice. Bill, uh, any uh, so if somebody wanted to get in touch with you um, and uh, solicit your services, how would they do that? So um, I'm always uncomfortable about being a little bit of an advertising guy, but this is how you do it. Uh, you look me up on LinkedIn. So it's William Tannenbaum and it's Tannenbaum. Uh, it's a single N. It's T-A-N-E-N-B-A-U-M. My grandfather couldn't afford three ends when he went to Ellis Island, so there were only two. And then uh, Moses and Singer is about like what it sounds. It's M-O-S-E-S, -S, like Moses from the Bible, and then Singer, S-I-N-G-E-R, like Broadway. So our firm is Moses and Singer. And then you can go to the Moses and Singer website, look up people, and you'll see my picture, and you'll see my bio, and you'll see my email address which is wtannenbaum at mosesandsinger.com, all one word, and that has a double S. No double N in Tannenbaum, but double S in Moses Singer. And I'd be delighted to talk to anybody, you know, off the clock, so to speak, and kind of find out what your issues are, give you some guidance, and then you go away. Because we're not mercenary. It's not all about the money for us. It's about the intellectual engagement and learning from people. So I invite calls, you know, and... It's like decision rights. If you have a view on decision rights, let me know because I want to learn from you. If you think I'm wrong and the data is technology, I'd love to have that discussion. And if you want some advice, I would love to give it to you. And what do you get? You get a lawyer who's really enthusiastic about this and wants to learn. And, you know, some things you know, some things you know you don't know. Some things you think you know, but you don't know them. But usually we know what we don't know. So that's how we know to ask questions. And I know I know this about you, Bill, as I have seen you at our conferences, giving talks, presentations, and really networking with a lot of people and really engaged. I know you have a lot of passion around this. And, and I think that came through today as well. So, so thank you for what you do. Well, thank you for the time. I really enjoyed talking with you and everybody else at the conferences. I really like going to the conferences. You know? And I like the fact that they're not legal conferences. I like that it's... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's real world stuff. And I really yeah. like that. So if you yeah. see me in a conference, come on up, you know, we'll have a chat. We'll have a sidebar. Well, Bill, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. And to all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date on the latest podcast and the latest in data management education, you may go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe until next time. 
Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational articles, blogs, and webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Mm-hmm.